There we go. Okay. Um, the agenda is that I'm going to tell you about five mega projects that are over a billion dollars that we've used NetPoint on and kind of hit one item of the many items that we've done on each of those projects. Sorry, having technical difficulties in moving the screens forward. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Not, so my name is Bruce Stefan. As Tim had mentioned, I've got over 40 years experience and I'm happy to have been with PMA for 25 years. Um, my background has covered all the things in the little bubbles going around and this is all in the last five years. Uh, construction management, PMOC, I'll tell you a little about that as I go. Scheduling in everything I do, claims because they just happen, PM systems and best practices is where now I can bring my 40 years and help big agencies to do better. So we'll talk about the seven line extension first. And here, this was our first use um, that I know of, of NetPoint on a transit project. And uh, the big thing that helped here was helping executives take informed action. So the seven, one of the things I love about transit um, is that you really make a big difference in the communities in which you live. And in the case of the seven train extension project, uh, this $2 billion project is bringing transit over to the west side of Manhattan, a very underserved area. If you ever look at a subway map of Manhattan, you'll see that there's lots of subway lines right up till about 8th Avenue. And then we go all the way out to 12th Avenue and a highway and there's nothing over there. So getting a train over to the west side was a big deal. And it's helped to uh, revitalize the neighborhoods formerly known as Hell's Kitchen in Chelsea. And uh, what you see in the photo there, uh, those big glass and steel office towers are the Hudson Yards redevelopment that was made possible because of the transit line going over there. Uh, the line in short is about 7,000 feet of twin rock tunnels. It's an extension of an existing line that goes between Grand Central Terminal and 34th Street. Now it goes all the way over to the Jacobs Javits Convention Center. Um, at one point we were gonna have the Olympics in New York and it was gonna take it, take the train under the Hudson River and over to um, one of the stadiums in New Jersey, but that didn't happen. Um, the, it involves two stations, one at 34th Street, Times Square, uh, one at 34th and one at Javits Station. And it includes the typical amenities you would expect in a station, finishes and all the systems. And it opened to the public September of 2015. Okay, we were second, uh, our, our PMA was seconded. Our role is that we were seconded to the MTA team during construction. We were out in the field office with them. We provided project controls, scheduling, claims avoidance, delay analysis and claims resolution. But more importantly, we were the advisor directly to the project executive and above him, the MTA uh, capital construction president. Uh, that president was an extremely hands-on person who actually was using that point um, on a twice weekly basis to brief the contractor senior management and New York City Transit's operations. He had over 50 executives in these meetings and he personally walked the meeting participants through the sublet lines. And his main purpose in doing this was that he was holding the responsible parties in the room to tell them what was wrong and what they were doing to fix it. And um, what made it easier for him to do is that our folks had put together very, very simple fragments like the one you see right here um, that, you know, not too long before that project was about to get up and started. Uh, we said that it went live in September. This was in May of the same year. Um, he could identify what are the systems that are causing the problem? Where's the main interaction have to happen? And what are these dates going to be? So that was our intro at MTA into using NetPoint. Uh, the main advantages of it there were that the executive management used it to coordinate with contractors and agency staff. And this was a key factor to getting the job done. I saw it in person. I wasn't on that project, but on the next project I talk about, you'll see that as project controls people, we predominantly rely on the managers we report the information to, to take the data we give them forward. And one of the big frustrations I think for a lot of project controls people is that quite often the people um, who we report to, you know, kind of say, well, thanks for telling me and don't do much. So that was a key point here is that we had a, a 
engaged manager who knew how to read the information we provided because we made it so simple and actually used it to get the job done. Um, we also used it to analyze contractor claims and we used it in our status reports to key stakeholders, which included the Federal Transit Administration. So from those humble beginnings, we moved into Second Avenue Subway for the same client, the MTA Capital Construction. One of their branches is New York City Transit, who's the operational um, side of the house when the train goes online. And here, it was really helping to get the project done on time. So a little bit about the project. This project had two miles of twin board tunnels in the Upper East Side. So now we can't call the Upper East Side a poorly served neighborhood. It does have the four, five, and six trains here, but anybody who's been in New York, they were packed like they say they are in Japan, where people have to get stuffed into the train. And when I was using it to go to the field office here on 96th Street, I often had to let two trains go by before I could get on one. So this was something that was sorely needed. Their ultimate goal is to run those trains all the way up to the beginning of Harlem here, or the middle of Harlem in 125th Street. And that phase is currently underway um, in early planning and design. Um, they connected this new line, which extended from 63rd Street to 96th Street to an existing queue line. And so therefore, even though they're only putting in a small two mile segment, it takes you to everywhere in Manhattan if you live up in this neighborhood. And uh, so very convenient. I personally used it to get to work after that. And it made life a lot easier for me than taking that four, five, six. So this involved three new stations and one station that had to be rehabilitated. That was the 63rd Street station. Uh, had a four and a half billion dollar overall cost and was known as the most expensive train uh, transit project in the world. Um, part of that is just what it costs to do business in New York City. The revenue service date was established as December 31st, 2016. Remember that date, it becomes important to recognize how difficult the assignment the PMA was given is. Um, and this, like any other uh, project, in, uh, especially underground subway lines, involves state-of-the-art fire safety systems and communication systems that had to interact with all the other elements of the project, including elevators, escalators, vent buildings, and big exhaust fans. Um, new for New York City was having an HVAC system in a, a subway. And so, um, you know, that's not something I think that's going to expand to the whole system, but it's nice to have. So our role on this project, um, PMA actually started on the project way earlier, back in the days when uh, they had awarded a, a design contract to AECOM. And we were part of the AECOM team. We provided the lead scheduler and we built the first master schedule for the project. Um, over time, um, we got off of that AECOM team. Um, they actually hired our person, but no harm, uh, no hard feelings. And uh, we were then brought later on back into the project around the time that they had been building it for many years, knew that it was not going to get done on time, and decided that it absolutely had to get done on time. Um, the date that I gave you, that December 31st, 2016, is the date that was in the grant that was signed by the FTA, and uh, they did not want to go back to the FTA and ask for more time. They also realized that if they could get it done on time, they would save a ton of money. So there was a, another advantage and some money could be put out there that would have otherwise been spent to take longer and then pay a contractor for delays to speed it up. So the announcement was made on February 24th that they allocated $66 million it was to be paid to five contractors to speed up the construction and get it done on time. <clears throat> so the governor looked for some people who could help. PMA was selected and I was hired as the chief of acceleration and claims management. That was my title. Um, and we were assigned to the CM teams to help make sure this job got done on time. So big responsibility and the governor breathing down our necks. And uh, many of you have seen Andrew Como on TV now uh, in the middle of the, corona, uh, the COVID crisis. And uh, you can tell he's a real hard hitter and he's on top of things. And that's exactly how he was with this project. So we actually came on board a little before the date of that announcement. We started in mid-December, but we still had till the following December to get things done. And the first few months was spent drafting and negotiating acceleration agreements with those five contractors. Um, because we know schedule well, we made sure that this was not money that was handed to a contractor and maybe you got something and maybe you didn't. We um, wrote the contract that they negotiated. We tied it, uh, we tied 
we created 21 different milestones. You're seeing a handful of them right here. And this was 21 milestones for just one contract. Most of my discussion for this project is going to be about the system-wide contract. The other four contracts were the uh, contractors who were responsible for finishing the stations. And that was one of the big challenges here on this project was that the infrastructure for the systems, the conduits that were put in place in the walls and the ceilings, whatever, were put in place by a separate contractor who was building the station. And that became a big source of the delay to getting this project started up because the contractor came out um, to do the systems and said, hey, I don't see a pipe sticking out of the wall with a pull tag on it. I can't get started until you got that. And when he looked on the other side of the conduit that was sticking through the wall, he'd find that it wasn't connected all the way through. So um, we were not aware of this till he came on board, but we put a whole lot of milestones to make sure we'd be protected when those delays happened. And sure enough, they did. And we not only defined a milestone with a couple sentences here and put a date on it and put some money on it that you don't see here, but we made sure that we knew when this activity, when this milestone was complete and by tying it to every activity in the schedule that was relevant to doing that and to verify that they were done, we made sure that every activity in the schedule was done in the field. So by the time we got those agreements signed, it was April. That leaves us eight months to get this project in revenue service. And the contractor was still doing civil work in at least one station and had not even yet started pulling cables for extreme for a large number. You can kind of see the count here on the screen. Um, we had to get a LAN WAN up and running. Nothing works without a backbone. Um, and that include the fiber network, but there's fire alarm, intrusion access control, radios, um, public address systems, customer information signs, the closed circuit TV, the HPI, SPI of the phones. There was many, many more systems than the ones we were showing on the screen. These were the ones that were critical. <clears throat> so the Mission Impossible music should be playing in the background for you right now. And uh, I do talk about this project more extensively and I call it the miracle on Second Avenue. And getting it done at Christmas time made that a little more relevant. So I wanna spend a little time with what value this um, net point uh, view that you're seeing here uh, brought to the table. First off, this is July now, we're six months from completion. We're looking at a single station and what we're showing um, the management of MTA and the president of MTA Capital Construction. First off, um, at a single station, the interrelationships between the various communication systems. So now systems that you normally don't think of as talking to each other, you're doing startup and testing and you need to have all these things talk to each other so that when a fire alarm goes off, the elevator goes to another floor, the big exhaust fans in the tunnel turn on, the customer information signs tell people how to get out, and the doors that might be locked that would get them to an exit have to pop open by the automated controls. So everything kind of talked to each other. There were a lot of ties between things, and we helped them to understand that. Secondly, it helped to show um, the delays to the acceleration milestone. So um, up top, you see milestone 20, complete the LAN WAN, originally scheduled to be done in June. You see milestone 17, which is the, um, the whole SIT test, meaning the system integration test, done except for the escalators, elevators, and combined fire alarm, because <coughs> we knew we weren't going to get those done by this time frame. And uh, pre-revenue service training is one of the key milestones. So we're, we're notifying them of the milestones, and we're showing the variance. Here's a 740 day variance on milestone 17, a 45 day variance on milestone 20. And we're identifying the causes of the delay so that they could be addressed. So here, land when waiting for permanent power, grounding and temporary cooling. So basically the room's not ready to put the equipment in. Over here, it's delays due to the conduits done by the station contractor, the problem I pointed out earlier. And over here, we can't test the elevators and escalators until they get them in place and the entrance isn't done yet. So obviously day to date right here, the work looking forward and the status of how that's affecting the milestone. And anything you see going past this green line is not a good thing. We were hoping for a little bit of uh, contingency. And right now this thing is uh, pushing out to the last dates. You're not seeing all the schedules that push it, but you're seeing some key things. <clears throat> so now we're in August. Um, we're looking at another view of the net point schedule we were given. There's only four months to the grant date. Everything's critical. And uh, now we're starting to use net point on the project to identify and resolve delays on a daily basis. 
you're starting to see longer variances. Here's milestone 13, getting through all the field tests, not the system integration test yet, but just getting some of the basic tests. This is when they're supposed to. Now, pre-revenue service training, uh, I just want to explain that term. That is not sitting in a classroom listening to someone lecture you. That actually means running the trains. So for us to go into revenue service, it's not the contract a substantial completion date. And you'll see from one of the other projects, the agencies like to have about a year after the contract is done to work out the bugs in the system. And because we had to get it in revenue service by December, we are finishing the project at the same time that we are hoping to get the train, uh, not have bugs and be up and running. So we needed uh, the cushion of time to December um, to actually let the agency work the trains. They ended up having to do it concurrently. What you're seeing on this chart, um, this is you know, the data date again. Here's the work that's already in progress, but not yet done. And the reason it's not done is written in red right over it. No ground in one room, another ground there, confirming out of phase issues get resolved on a traction power substation that runs the trains. In the middle, we're talking about why the uh, in-service testing was delayed and it's kind of driven around down here. And here's the in-service testing going past the pre-revenue service training. We cannot get pre-revenue service training till the agency gives us a track circuit bulletin that says it's okay to get out there and start running those trains. And these are all the impediments to them getting that. Um, you can see another one of the impediments, another one of those 21 milestones was traction power to the third rail. It was supposed to get done in June, now forecast for um, August. So that's one thing that's gonna stop you from running a train is not having power. And these are the elements that are driving those parts out. And over here, we're describing status and why the bulletin couldn't get approved and what the other issues are. And then describing here other prerequisites to in-phase service testing and some other the other problems. So if you're the busy executive and you got to figure out where to focus your attention to make sure this project keeps moving, your roadmap is a single page and pretty clear and easy to read. So now we're in October on this project and this um, representation in NetPoint is basically showing you um, the key milestones that have not um, or that mostly have not been finished. The, uh, where the blue line is, is approximately the original milestone that was in those uh, list of 21 milestones that we had given them to finish. And um, the different colors that are expanding out from there are update by update, how much delay was encountered between those updates. So the project, you know, more problems were developed. You say, how do they lose three months in a month? It was that um, they were finding more and more problems as they started to do the startup and testing. And everything just kept getting longer and longer and longer. We had two good news. Um, the By October, traction power was up and running. It had finished in September. And the signal system also finished in September near the end of there. So now we could run a train and we could make sure it doesn't crash into anything but we don't have the comm systems needed to be able to let people come into that station with fire alarms that work, with elevators and a, and a fan that'll take the smoke out. So this was big bad news that was communicated very clearly and effectively. The ongoing slipping allowed the president of MTA and the project executive to beat the hell out of the contractor and try to figure out what's going on and what can be done about it. And then um, the problems continued after we went into revenue service. Many systems did not manage to be able to get up and running. These were the two key systems. We had to put a fire watch in the stations until the fire alarm system could be fully vetted out and tested. And the same with those intrusion access doors. So we had security guards at doors and people with vests standing by panels ready to react if there was a fire. And so then we had to track the substantial completion. What was the longest path to it? Um, and, you know, fire alarm was more critical. <laughs> and there was a lot of other remaining work as well that ultimately had to get finished, but the trains were running. I was riding them. You would not have known that, um, you know, all these things were not there. So they made things do. And we clearly pointed out our assumptions. So again, busy executive, you know, the status of things. And so, like I said, miraculously, we did get the train into revenue service uh, by December 31st. As a result of that success, I mean, it's a beautiful station. You do not see any station in New York that looks like these. Um, <clears throat> their ultimate plan for uh, Second Avenue Subway, this was phase one. 
Phase two is the one that was underway, but they plan to go all the way down to lower Manhattan at some point. So as a result of using that point and getting that job done early, they successfully made that December 31st milestone, but there was one final delay. The governor decided that instead of opening on December 31st, he was gonna have a New Year's Eve party in the station. And this is actually a photo from that New Year's Eve party. I did not get invited, but others who were there took the picture and shared it with me. And you can see he got a lot of good press, Governor Como, for getting the thing done on time. That doesn't happen often. And I must say he would show up without bodyguards and walk through the site on his own. So, I mean, he was actively engaged and that was a key element. So quickly, how did NetPoint help? The entire program schedule was summarized in NetPoint. So after our success on the seven line, um, the agency themselves, their chief scheduler, used NetPoint and even though he was getting um, P6 schedules from the contractors, chose to put his master schedule into NetPoint and uh, do that integration. Um, and he said, next time I think we'll make everybody use NetPoint. Now, it hasn't happened yet, but that's our hope. Um, the key fragments we used at the team meetings to identify and resolve the issues. On this project, Second Avenue Subway, the president of MTA Capital Construction every Friday had a coordination meeting with all five contractors in the field office I was located in. He used the fragments that we were creating to beat up everybody in the room. And I was there one time when he actually called the president of Schindler Elevator in Germany and told him he had to get some inspectors out there the next day, five inspectors, because this was New York City Transit. And if we didn't open the train, the governor was gonna come over and beat him up. And these things happened we actually got people to mobilize. So he used them to prime that meeting, uh, to uh, chair that meeting and make things happen. We later, when the project ended, used NetPoint to analyze contracted delay claims and allocate responsibility for the delays that we didn't resolve. The job finished later than it would have finished, but for um, the delays, they were supposed to have a lot more float. And we used NetPoint to present the claim settlements of those time extensions. So now I'm moving into a completely different role. Um, I am serving on this project as the project management oversight consultant on behalf of the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, Federal Transit Administration loans money to, or, or gives money to transit agencies to build these multi-billion dollar capital programs. And none of this could happen without federal funding. Um, so in this case, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I spoke too soon. No, on the Crenshaw project, um, this is another contract at PMA1. We worked for the agency. I'll get to the FTA project next. Anyway, um, in this project, what NetPoint did was help LA Metro and FTA predict the revenue service date. So PMA, uh, well, I'll tell you about Metro first. So this is a project in Los Angeles. It's a $1.2 billion design build contract to build a light rail. Um, and it's an overall $2 billion program. There was a storage yard that took up the rest of the money. The um, project is an eight and a half mile long project that connects two key lines down in Los Angeles. And some of you may be surprised that Los Angeles has a subway system, but I'm here to tell you that it does. Um, this is the Expo line, partly surface, partly underground, and the Green Line. And the um, Crenshaw LAX connector connects the Green Line up to the Expo line. Um, it's a mix, it's an eight and a half mile long, so a much longer uh, segment than what you saw in the other projects. It's got <coughs> a total of um, aerial, underground, and uh, at grade running, and it has eight stations that you see scattered throughout in the black area. And here, like uh, all the transit projects, it serves um, a poor area where many of the residents that live between those two lines um, could not get to work without having public transit to help them get to it. So uh, it serves a very valuable purpose. Now we first won work with LA Metro back in 2015. It was a short contract of 10 weeks long and they wanted somebody to come in and look at um, whether the contract to schedule was believable uh, to do a schedule risk workshop and see how bad it could get and then do a schedule mitigation workshop to tell them how they could improve their probability of getting it done on time. When we came on board, we um, the job had been going on since September 10th, 2013. Its substantial completion date was five years from then in September 2018. And you'll note here that the revenue service date was October 31st. So 
the agency gave themselves more than one year to do that pre-revenue service training that they had months to do on Second Avenue Subway while work was still going on. When we came on board, there was also a time extension that had been granted for 35 days that consumed float to that milestone. And um, as a point of reference, FTA on transit projects that they loan money on like to see 25% time contingency. There's not many agencies, I think, that specify time contingency requirements. So LA Metro was a project that they didn't have as much contingency. So while you think a year is good, they only had 14.6% contingency. So not, not good enough for the federal government. And at the point we came on board, the project was listed as being 129 days, calendar days late, basically four months. So to do our first part of the assignment, we built a net point model. Um, the contractor's schedule, this design build schedule was 10,000 activities plus. Uh, we had to boil that all down um, to get an understanding and be able to explain to the agency folks our findings. Um, what you're seeing here is a typical thing we do in claims work. This was not a claims assignment, but we used that technique, the baseline schedule versus the as built schedule update. We came on board in May, the current schedule was the March 28th schedule. And um, looking at this, we could immediately make a, a lot of key points. The first activity on the critical path was the shoring design, and they took a little bit longer to do that. Um, then they were gonna buy shoring um, as a, uh, you know, finish the start type of relationship. When shoring took them too long, they went out and started the procurement before they got completely done but they took a heck of a lot longer than what they had originally planned. And there's a couple of new activities that pop up on the March critical path that were not in the baseline and they are driving the start of excavation. Um, now the current status of the project at this point was that they had to excavate down at the expo station, the one that was at the top of the chart I was just showing you. And they had to um, get down to a certain point so that they could put a mud slab in, assemble the TBM and start to run these two TBMs uh, you know, down to the underground section, which was in that north part of the project. Um, as a result of their delays up front and not get taking care of these activities, uh, there was a delayed start to the excavation for that station and therefore the ability to mobilize the TBM. And uh, so this, you know, we we're able to clearly show in the middle between the as planned and the as built, uh, the effects of that one problem. Well, then they get started on the excavation that's shown up here and they take about the amount of time they thought and they're not quite getting where they need to. Uh, they have to start doing things in a different manner and it's taking them substantially longer. So when they get it to a certain point, they get that mud slab in as quickly as possible so they can start their TBM. Um, but they've pushed themselves into the holiday season. They're losing time and uh, the project is actually not the four months behind they were reporting, but the eight months, but more like eight months behind. And they've obscured it by shortening up a couple durations and swapping around some logic, um, kind of like taking out a few ties, but no backup to how they might actually have saved four months in doing what they did. Um, that was a zoom in on the much bigger schedule that we used to boil everything down. Uh, this was the model that we used to do part two of this assignment, which was the risk workshop. Now, back in 2015, we did not have net risk, so we used a more standard risk tool. I think we used OPRA uh, for this one, but you'll see on one of the other slides um, on our uh, later forecasts, we are using net risk and we're using um, all of the other net point suite tools to continue to do our work. Um, we did get a, a follow-on assignment after this initial assignment. Um, so here, I can't reveal the secrets of what we had come up with, but our timing was not as late as the project has actually gone way back in 2015, but there's many things we could not control when we were making our forecast. Um, at this point, we were forecasting civil work and our uh, model focused very heavily on civil work. Um, we ran the risk workshop extremely successfully. The FTA was present at that workshop. We, it was the first time that we had gotten a agents, we had gotten them through their risk register, which had a lot of risks. 
Um, they had been only dealing with the red risks uh, during their progress meetings, and we got them through the whole thing. <clears throat> now we go into the risk mitigation workshop. Oh, and one thing we did during that risk workshop with NetPoint that was important was that we printed out a big e-size plot of the entire project. Now, as you can imagine, with a 10,000 activity schedule, nobody really had a clue um, where everything was going in the end. So they were able for the first time to really see the entire project, the following, you know, they were three years, two years into the project, three years to go, and they could see what was happening further downstream, which they had to pay attention to as we looked at the risks. So it was enormously helpful. You know, people would start saying, oh, this is going to be a six month impact to the schedule. And we'd say, well, let me zoom into the model here. This wasn't on the critical path. This is what's driving. Oh, okay, maybe that's only a two, not a five. Then we go into the risk mitigation workshop. We've got the big plot on the wall. We're zooming into the parts we need on the screen. And we're trying to extract teeth from the contractor to get them to admit that they can make up some time. We have the designer in the room. We have the CM in the room. And we have the owner and operations folks in the room. And we are together trying to figure out how we can get this project done earlier. And um, having it on the wall, having people, people were constantly going over to NetPoint on the wall and coming up with an idea that they could see a different way to do things. <clears throat> so as a result, we were able to bring the substantial completion date back to November 2018. And the critical path was, as we had um, assumed, going through the uh, train control and the communications, the same problems that we had run into when we were working on Second Avenue Subway. Um, now, as a result of the good work we did there for LA Metro, and with FTA watching, um, in 2016, we won another prime contract. Well, we won a subcontract with a prime uh, that we were sort of JV with to do a best practice, um, best practice study for the agency, at, which included a survey of peer agencies. Excuse me. And the reason for that, LA Metro accelerated their capital program. So they're the second biggest transit agency in the country. They have a $50 billion capital program they were about to start or had just started a bit of in 2016. They had some successes. They had some failures. They asked us to come on board and look at their entire construction management practice and uh, give them advice. So we worked on that project and stayed in their radar screen. In 2017, FTA told Metro that their risk and contingency management plan was unacceptable and they weren't fully in compliance with the grant's risk requirements. And why don't you bring back that company that had done that schedule analysis and maybe they can help you get this thing put together. So we helped them with that. And with this ongoing relationship that we started to build, um, they suddenly realized the value that uh, you know net risk, net point was bringing to the table. And we morphed into a independent neutral. We had been working both with the contractor and the agency we very much took a um, neutral stand in all our advice, and we were viewed by both sides as somebody who would come in and tell the real story and didn't have any ax to grind. Uh, we're not involved in the claims there. We're not involved in anything there except doing this independent analysis and guessing when the thing is going to finish. We come in every quarter, and I report directly to either the CEO of the entire agency or the deputy CEO using that point and um, other findings that we have to make a forecast every month. So when we came back to do the first of those in 2018, um, at that point, the TBM had successfully completed on time. And um, there were some earlier delays, but they had gotten over that. They were worried originally that the uh, uh, durations they had shown were aggressive and other people had two TBMs and they only had one. Those problems were behind us. Um, now, when we're modeling, if the civil work is mostly done, the TBM is going to finish that last bore in a timely fashion to all intents and purposes, and it in fact did. Um, now the focus is on what we knew from a work on Second Avenue Subway to be the critical path, which is the system startup and testing. And as you can see by the day to date here, they were already starting on um, some of the work that was relevant to being able to ultimately do that testing that was needed. This was the model that we built the second time around, uh, covering all the systems startup and testing. And this is the model that we still use with enhancements every quarter today. In fact, I just did my latest forecast um, last week. Um, this was the first time I had to do it virtually. Usually we get to walk the job site. 
Uh, this is just some photos of when they started pulling the cable through the tunnels. Uh, a lot of this is the comm cable, some of it may be traction power. This is the train control room, and this is a more recent picture from uh, the last time we had done a site visit <coughs> previous to the coronavirus. So now we're using net risk to forecast the revenue service date. Um, the date in the grant for this project uh, was October 2019. The agency went back and asked for some additional time from FTA. Uh, New York didn't want to do that. This agency was not afraid to. And uh, they did get an extension to that date, but that date is still being forecast to be missed. Um, but the contractor currently, they're shooting for December <coughs> of this year. Um, that point was very useful also to both verify the accuracy of our results by looking at the criticality index charts. Um, we, you know, we were able to see if what was showing up as critical made sense based on everything we heard from doing risk workshops every quarter and the things that the project participants, both contractor and owner, told us. And, um, you know, our own analysis and uh, watching of the risk register. So, you know, what's on here makes sense. It made sense to everybody in the room and they had a much better feeling about the uh, results that we came out with. So as of today, the public date for revenue service <coughs> is mid-2021, and uh, the project is looking much better than you saw in the other pictures. The tracks are in, um, you know, still work going on, but we are much closer, and it is possible, I believe, to achieve that milestone. So what did what did NetPoint do for the Crenshaw project? Um, it, was a, it was the only tool I think we could have used to summarize a 10,000 activity schedule onto a large plot and help everybody understand what the heck the project was all about when they were not yet at the halfway point. Um, the summary plan uh, was able to be used in the mitigation workshop to great um, use. The clarity of the plans allowed everybody to get the big picture and be able to come up with good suggestions. Um, one of the other, excuse me, <coughs> I'm not dying of coronavirus, but I do have seasonal allergies. Um, one of the other things that was very useful, um, there was a lot of, and there still is a lot of preferential crew logic ties within the schedule. And NetPoint did a great job of really highlighting that for people. And, you know, people would turn around to the contract and go, hey, wait a minute, you're telling me that's holding up that. And the contractor immediately had to back down and, you know, help to participate in the mitigations. And it really um, unearthed a lot of alternative sequencing and helped the project to do better than it might have done without all of this uh, assistance. So now I'm moving into the work I was telling you about before. We are now the oversight consultant for the FTA. They liked what we did down in LA Metro enough that the day after doing that risk workshop, a promised contract from our separate FTA contract came in. Um, we were a new PMOC in 2014. And so they kept giving us small little bus rapid transit projects of, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to try us out and see if we knew what we were doing. Right after making that presentation, um, the director uh, was actually the guy in the room, the person who's currently the director of Region 9, which is out in California and the Western states. Um, the next day we get the award of this contract that they've been talking about, but dragging their feet. So I guess they liked what they saw. Um, and here, we're helping them to better understand schedule issues. So we don't do delay analysis. <clears throat> we're basically like an audit organization and I'll explain that in a minute. So this project is a three and a half billion dollar project they gave us to watch over. So it was a big jump from the hundred thousand dollar buses. Um, $2.7 billion of the 3.5 is federally funded. And what you're seeing in the map over here is the BART system. Um, it's 120 plus track miles. And what you should notice, this is San Francisco over here. This is Oakland over here. They've got a total of five lines, four of which go through a single choke point, one tunnel under the bay, two tracks. So this is a major impediment to trying to achieve the project goal, which is that I, I used to um, live out in the suburbs over here. And I'd get on a train at the Walnut Creek station and come into our office in the Embarcadero through that corridor. And our trains were nowhere near as crowded as the ones in New York City, but they would get in there and it was getting pretty bad. They currently um, run 23 trains an hour during peak hours. And those trains can be anywhere from four cars to 10 cars. The goal of this project is to increase 
the throughput through this choke point to <coughs> 30 trains an hour, and they're all going to be 10 car trains during peak hours. So um, you can imagine if you were the operator of this system, how complicated it's going to be to control trains coming from four different directions and all trying to get at the same point at the same time. So one of the keys to being able to achieve that goal was communication-based train control. The current technology on most train systems, you don't know where that train is within a mile or so. So you can't run your trains too close together because you could have an accident. With communication-based train control, they're able to run their trains a car length apart and squeeze a lot more trains on the track. But if you're squeezing more trains on the track, you need more power. So that's the next bullet here. And you also need more cars. And once you have more cars, you need a place to store them. So that's the project. When we talk about the core corridor, it's only this piece. The costs outside of the grant is, you know, the work to do the communication-based train control everywhere else on the system. So our role as a PMO um, to oversee this is to kind of be the audit agency for the federal government for any agencies that they loan money to. The federal government doesn't want to put a couple billion dollars out on a project and have that project fail, like unfortunately happened with the ARC project in New Jersey when Governor Christie decided not to move forward with that project. Um, they had to pay back money to the federal government that had been granted to get them to that point. So they don't like to have that happen. It's an embarrassment to the agency. And so they have this PMOC program to make sure that when someone gives them an estimate, when someone gives them a schedule, they're going to meet that schedule. And to meet that schedule, we have to also look at whether they're um, going to be working safely, whether they're going to be watching quality, because they don't want to have a bad project at the end, <clears throat> and whether their people have the capacity and capability to manage that project along with all the other projects in their portfolio. And we also take a look at their readiness to go into the stage gates that are out there. Um, it involves a deep dive into cost and schedule. And uh, we do some risk facilitation on every one of these projects to set the contingency. Going to move a little faster here. Uh, this one's easy. All we did for the FTA is make it simple. So $3.5 billion project, it really consists of four separate projects with separate project managers. And we boiled it down to just the basics that they needed to know, um, how much contingency was on each project, which was the real driver, you know, where is the contingency hidden, et cetera. And these reports we write actually go to Congress. And now as part of reviewing the schedules of these agency folks and the consultants that work for them, just like we have done for LA Metro, we use um, Schedule MD, one of the other NetPoint suite tools, to find the problems with the schedule and then provide a guidebook or a roadmap to the sponsor agency so that they can improve their schedule. A big part of our assignment is to work with the agency, not to be the gotcha guy, but help them to do their job better. So we have educated quite a few consult, um, quite a few agencies on schedule techniques and uh, you know how to use. Uh, schedule MD to make their schedules better. So for the FTA projects, and when I'm speaking of projects here and not just BART, I wanted to mention some things we've done for some of the other agencies we watched over but did not do on the BART project. So first off, you saw the simple schedule. Secondly, um, on another one, we got a Microsoft project schedule on one of those bus projects. Um, it was big enough that when we brought it over using the automatic um, you know, synchronization between Microsoft Project and NetPoint, it still was a bit of a mess, but thanks to the layout manager and the ability to use activity codes to sort things into swim lanes, we were able to very quickly build a schedule model that we could use during the risk workshops, that we could risk, and that we could use to explain FTA and the sponsor why they had to do some things different to get their project done on time, or why they had um, issues with contingency. And we find that the ability with those big yellow and red lines that um, are joining things up to focus on the logic and how the activities relate to each other and how you can accelerate your project by breaking preferential ties, it, it seems to be invaluable. They really notice uh, the logic. We were able to find quality issues quickly and um, give them a good list to fix them. And uh, it, it, what I really appreciated um, doing the net risk, I don't use Oprah, I didn't use any of those other tools, but I am using net risk. It's ex, it was extremely simple to use. I was able to bring my risk register in. I brought the net point schedule in. I was able to assign the risks to the activities 
and run the Monte Carlo myself. And uh, being a do-it-yourself kind of guy, I really appreciated that. <clears throat> the last project I will speak to you about is the Third Street Light Rail Central Subway project. And here we're helping SFMTA allocate delay responsibility. Uh, this is another project that's almost on the same time frame as the LA Metro project. <clears throat> so this project in San Francisco, my backyard here, um, I'm, I'm over at the picture on the right, and there's a 4th Street light rail project that currently runs along the Embarcadero here. And what they want to do is they want to pick up uh, some of the trains coming along this line and run them straight up through the middle of the south of Market area. This is downtown San Francisco right in here. <clears throat> into Chinatown uh, through Union Square. And um, eventually they have a bigger plan like New York did to extend all the way out to Fisherman's Wharf and beyond. But this is this segment. It's a 1.7 mile long run. It's surface running right here. There's a portal at the south of Market. And uh, then this part is all underground and this is storage track at the end of the tunnel. So the tunnel went a little further than the station does. Densely populated area, urban problems galore in this Union Square and, uh, and Chinatown area. Um, it's a $1.5 billion project and FTA is watching it. We are representing the um, agency in this case, not the FTA. So we were first brought on the project when, as often happens with PMA, uh, the agency and the project ran into problems and they realized that um, they were not going to make their time frames. Schedule was not going well, and they needed to bring in somebody who knew more about schedule than the contractor or the people they had on board. So um, we came on board first as the schedule manager in 2016. And in that role, we do the typical stuff. We review the contractor's schedule. We do TIAs when uh, any time is sought and any change order. We prepare and present the monthly report that FTA sees. We conduct risk-based analysis to determine the likely revenue service date at the request of FTA again. And we lead uh, the discussions on schedule in the weekly meeting. So NetPoint is in front of everybody almost all the time. Um, after a year of seeing that we can do a good job on schedule and realizing they had a huge backlog of change orders, they brought us on board and myself personally as a claims manager in 2017 to address a backlog of claims analyze delays. <clears throat> and so my role was to actually try to move things forward. Um, we were successful. Um, a lot of the problems always end up being schedule related problems and schedule delays. And so that was one of the, the key things we had to deal with. Um, and we near the end uh, when they realized that, you know, change, change order by change order, claim by claim was not the way they were going to get to the finish line with resolving disputes with the contractor, getting a global settlement and putting that behind us and moving forward to a timely completion, they decided to try to go global. Um, this is just an image of um, the current schedule that our chief scheduler is using on the project to drive that finish date of the different milestones. You can see startup and testing and those same systems we talked about on Second Avenue Subway and LA Metro are in the forefront at this point in this at project. <clears throat> and this was the global delay. So we were given another very short time frame, like we were in LA Metro to come on board and look at five years of delays that had not been analyzed and come up with some strategy of allocating those delays and um, letting the agency know how much they owed the contractor and how much the contractor had to pick up on their own. And what you're seeing here um, we layered over some Excel spreadsheet on top of our net point view. And what the headers are of the shaded um, columns are the uh, critical path that went through the project for its life cycle. Um, so the critical station was the Chinatown station. It's where the train control systems were kept. Um, they had to put the slurry walls up to allow the excavation of the head house for that station. Then they had to put um, a cross cut in place uh, with a barrel vault to get from the station to um, the platforms. They had to uh, mine out the platform using the uh, new European tunneling method, uh, Austrian tunneling method rather NATO, And that involved uh, soil hardening to maintain the excavation during that. So that was this big s sequence. And then what they called the balance of the CTS work, we were going just to the present date, not to the project completion. It's a backward luck. 
And um, what we were able to show in each of the windows that were represented by those shaded columns, what was the total delay during that period of, during the work on that critical path? They were 194 days late putting those slurry walls in. How much time the contractor asked for, for that delay, which was zero. What their possible entitlement was, we came up with about 118 days and how much would be therefore inexcusable. And we did that um, window by window and we did it all in the process of um, a little less than two months. So great tool to explain it. Uh, what you're looking at here is just as planned versus as built with an extending line showing like this took longer and that's how long it delayed each of the different items as we went along the way. At the bottom not shown was the text words that explained why that 118 days was their problem and why these, uh, I'm sorry, was our problem and why the other 76 was theirs. Um, so the main advantage was just to summarize everything and uh, make it clear. I'm already at my time, so I'm gonna, just gonna let you, nothing new from what I said before on this slide and I'm ready to take questions. Thanks, Bruce. Great presentation. Uh, are you able to ask a question? Are you able to click on that box and open up the window for questions? Yes, I am. And I have it open right now. Okay, so the first question, uh, it says for the Second Avenue, it is great to see the owner being on board with NetPoint. Would you like to know, would like to know how is the buy-in reluctance of all the five GCs. Um, on Second Avenue Subway, the contractors themselves did not use um, NetPoint. They actually put together what we call the cartoon chart or a bubble chart in Excel with a bunch of circles to represent what was delaying them. So uh, we did not get buy-in from the contractors there. Although I know elsewhere in PMA, we have had success where a contractor who sees um, the value coming from the owner's side has brought PMI on board to help them with NetPoint, but it didn't happen on Second Avenue Subway. Thanks for that response. Um, yeah, let's see, you know, I'm gonna bring Eric up here for closing remarks. And I know I missed a few questions at the end of the last session, uh, they, they kind of rolled in late. So stay with us, Bruce, and then uh, let me bring Eric up too. Sure. Another question came up. Do you usually try to sync your net point summary schedules with P6 or do you most manually? Um, we have um, synced them when we get these schedules from the um, agencies because they're master schedules. They generally don't have more than 100, maybe 200 activities. And so they're much easier than if I was to try to bring in the 10,000 activity schedule that the contractor had. So um, the answer is it's a little mix of both. And uh, generally with the smaller master schedules that we get from the agencies, we'll do the sync for the big uh, schedules from the contractor. We do not do the sync. Um, there is one feature that I've recommended that may be in a future build of NetPoint, and that would be that to the extent that there's level of effort or hammock activities within a schedule um, or a WS summary, it would be great if we could just take over those activities into NetPoint. And then I would ideally like when we're reporting to a client on the status of the schedule to be able to take those activities out of the latest build of the contractor schedule each month throw them back into net point and have it kind of fall right where it was in our original model and show the differences. But it's a future um, feature that I think would be helpful to sync more. Okay, good response. Uh, so yeah, let me close the questions box and um, Bruce, I'm gonna mute you and I'm gonna bring Eric up and let him do the closing remarks. If we get more questions, I'll come back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Fantastic. Eric, Thanks, Bruce. That was a great session. Very informative. Um, well, uh, again, my name is uh, Eric Lothar. I'm an executive director at PMA out of our Boston office. And I have the privilege of uh, wrapping it up for today and thanking uh, all of our presenters and thanking all of our attendees for uh, for joining us. We, uh, we trust that you uh, enjoyed and, uh, the content and um, uh, just wanted to, th uh, to thank you for joining. The 
uh, following the, the conference today, you'll receive an, uh, an email uh, giving you an opportunity to provide some feedback via, via survey. So uh, thank you in advance for, uh, for completing that and sharing your feedback. Every year we strive to improve and, and offer uh, the best content and the best uh, uh, presentations and uh, net point functionality that, uh, that we can. So uh, your feedback is very valuable. Um, we often uh, are asked if the presentations will be available after, uh, after the conference and uh, wanted to assure you that they will be. Uh, all the recorded sessions will be available next week uh, and, and they'll be posted to our website. And you're likely to see an email uh, as well uh, directing you to where those can be found. Uh, it, it, in terms of additional opportunity for, uh, for training, don't forget that there are two on-demand sessions uh, that are available uh, on our website. Uh, they include uh, a, a session on our net risk software, a deep dive on, on the tool, as well as some training on how to move uh, data between uh, Oracle P6 and, and NetPoint. Um, and then lastly, uh, on May 15th, we're going to be doing a uh, cost and schedule risk workshop. It's a two hour training offered by PMA's Francisco Cruz and uh, Seve Ponce de Leon. And um, we hope that you'll register for that on our website and join for uh, that in-depth and very uh, informative uh, training on uh, cost and schedule integrated risk uh, work. So fantastic, thank you again. Uh, Brian, unless there's any other questions, I, I think we've had a full day. Yeah, I think there's another question in here for Bruce. Okay. There is, I do see it. Am I muted still? Nope, you're live. Okay, so this question is, didn't the contract specify the scheduling software to be used? Uh, that's the first part of the question. And um, yes, of course, the construction contracts did specify the scheduling software that the contractor had to use. and. Um, as of this time, I don't know of agencies who have yet specified uh, something like NetPoint um, for the contractors to use. NetPoint's sweet spot tends to be um, smaller schedules, whereas a contractor would need to have the level of detail um, in a P6 schedule to run a big project like some of the multi-billions that I've been talking about. Um, so, but there was not anything specified for us as a consultant to the agency as to what we would use for, um, you know, software for doing scheduling. So that's how we were able on uh, Seven Line to first use it, and then you know that's what they wanted us to use for all the subsequent things we do. Um, the second part of this question is: Did you also use the NetPoint for cash flow graphs? And on Second Avenue Subway, to my knowledge, we did not. Um, there was a number of people working on it. One of the other groups may have, but I certainly uh, didn't use it for cash flow or for resource, um, there was, you know, resources were a problem on the job. Um, we were tracking um, resource levels to make sure the contractor brought enough people to the table, but we did not use NetPoint for that on this project. Great, thanks. 